Welcome to day two of the 21st Amos Conference. Please welcome Secure World Foundation's Victoria Sampson. Welcome back to the Amos Conference. My name is Victoria Sampson. I'm the Washington Office Director of the Secure World Foundation. And I'm delighted to welcome you back to day two of both the conference and the Amos Policy Forum. Today, we'll be starting with a thought-provoking keynote from Quentin Perspiran, who is a researcher at the Science, Technology, and Innovation Governance Program, Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Tokyo. In the keynote today, he'll be discussing space traffic management, or STM, going into its origins, military's role historically in making STM regimes, and giving some of the views of emerging space nations. Please note that we will have some time for Q&A after Quentin is done, so please feel free to send in your thoughts and questions via the Q&A on the conference platform. With that, Quentin, love to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria, for the kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending where you are. So my name is Quentin Verspiren. I'm researcher at the Graduate School of Public Policy of the University of Tokyo and research fellow at the Japan Space Forum. Before starting my remarks, I would like to express my pleasure um, to be given this opportunity to open the second day of such a, a wonderful conference. But most of all, I want to warmly thank the Amos team and the Secure World Foundation for their invitation and trust. My remarks will serve as an opening to the following policy forum on challenges and opportunities in developing norms of behavior. I will therefore propose in this talk a few reflections on various elements from a policy perspective, not a technical one. I will touch upon the history of STM, the role of the military, and more generally, national security actors, and on the place of emerging nations in STM regime making. Overall, I will try to raise questions rather than to provide answers, which could be done by a large number of experts much wiser than I am. Most people consider that the concept of space traffic management is fairly recent from the end of the 20th century. In fact, the first reference to space traffic rules was made in 1932 by a Czechoslovak jurist called Vladimir Mendel in what is known as the first monograph on space law. It's written in German. The reason I mention this is that quite often in international space law, and in particular for issues related to space traffic management, we are reinventing the wheel every 20 to 30 years because of our lack of awareness of past efforts. Let me illustrate this statement with a few examples. In 1957, French jurist Eugène Pépin identified five elements that would require the creation of, I quote, regulatory rules for circulation in outer space. One, the ascension of rockets through sovereign airspace. Two, the re-entry of rocket bodies. Three, unintentional collisions between orbiting satellites, four, the need for identification of satellites in case of accident, and five, the avoidance of harmful radio interference. And all prominent experts at the time participated in the debate and shared these views. Then for around 30 years, STM, which was not called STM at the time, fell into a sort of oblivion until Lubos Perek presented his famous paper, Traffic Rules for Outer Space, during the 25th International Colloquium on Space Law, held in Paris in 1982, so 50 years after Mendel uh, invented the term of space traffic rule. These rules, although more detailed, roughly correspond to Pépin's five elements, a noticeable addition being the mitigation of space debris. At the time, however, STM studies were still in the realm of theory, it was only from the very end of the 20th century that the desire and need to define and actually implement traffic rules became tangible. On the 24th of July, 1996, French military satellite Cerise, operated on behalf of the French armed forces by UK company Surrey Satellite Technology, suddenly started to spin out of control. Unable to evaluate the cause uh, due to its lack of space surveillance capabilities, France had to request support from NASA and from the UK Space Track Network, which identified that the satellite was damaged by a piece of debris from an abandoned third stage of Ariane 1 rocket launched 10 years earlier in 1986, which makes Cerise the first space's first confirmed victim of a hit and run accident. 
A few years later, although there is no concrete evidence of causality, the concept of space traffic associated with the desire to manage it made a real and definite comeback. In 1999 and 2001, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics organized the fifth and sixth international space cooperation workshops, titled respectively, Solving Global Problems and Addressing Challenges of the New Millennium. These two workshops were the starting points for various initiatives aimed at developing new ideas on STM. They focused on orbital management, I quote, collision avoidance, relevant orbital debris issues, and regulatory framework needs. A key outcome of the 2001 workshop was the etab- establishment of an STM working group at the International Academy of Astronautics. This working group gathered for five years and produced one of the cornerstones of space traffic management literature, the 2006 IAA Cosmic Study on Space Traffic Management. The lesson I want to share with these examples is that STM is already an old field and that we are losing time, resources, and energy trying to solve issues that have been already discussed and solved in the past. The most emblematic being the recurring debate over the limit between air and space that often happens in, appears in STM literature. And this debate is the core of the spatialist, functionalist debate dear to space lawyers, mostly with air low background. And the current discussions that I could see on ICAO for space, the definition of a near space zone between airspace and outer space, were already discussed and considered obsolete in the 1950s. To go even further and show the importance to look at legal history, when John Cobb Cooper was proposing in the 1950s the same ideas to define the limit between airspace and outer space, an ICAO for space, the very same Frenchman, Eugène Pépin, that I mentioned before, was blaming him for reviving a debate from the 1910s. So 1910, 1950s, and we are restarting in 2010. So one modest piece of advice to all of us, let us really look at STM history. It spans over 90 years, but it is limited in content. There are not so many publications, there are ancient ones, but not so many. So it is not such a big effort to look at STM history, but it would allow us to stop reopening long closed debates. The second focus of these remarks is on an important actor, often overlooked in at least academic literature. I will start with three rhetorical questions. Who is the second largest satellite operator in the world with around 190 satellites, accounting for 8.5% of all satellites in orbit? So these are late uh, 2019 figures from the Union of Concerned Scientists. The answer is the US Armed Forces. Not far below are the Chinese and Russian militaries. Taking the example of China, the recent report uh, of Frank Rose at the Brookings Institution estimated that the Chinese government currently operates no less than 120 intelligence reconnaissance and surveillance, ISR, and remote sensing satellites. Second question. Who has the unrivaled ability to monitor outer space? The number one is, again, the US military, followed by the Russian armed forces, and most likely the Chinese ones. Third question, knowing the first two questions, who is purposely excluded from most academic studies on STM? Again, the answer is the military and national security actors, which are often ruled out as I would say agents of conservatism, or as the 2006 IAA Cosmic Study says, interfering factors which might hinder the establishment and operational effectiveness of a space traffic management regime. So it is critical to go beyond this um, common cliche that the military does not care about the sustainability of outer space. Cliche that I'm sure most of you in the audience fully reject. But even more, I I, I believe that we need to put the military back at the center of international STM regime making discussions. Now, I understand it's an extremely complicated topic. I have focused almost exclusively on it for the last three years, and I have more questions than answers. Continuing on the attachment of the military and national security actors to the safety and sustainability of the space domain on which they are so dependent, I want to point out 
that progress has been made to ensure cleaner activities, in particular in terms of debris mitigation. The US Air Force, for instance, has strongly improved its compliance with the US government orbital debris mitigation standard practices. Actually, I will make some kind of advertisement, but in tomorrow's orbital debris session, I will be unveiling in a paper new data obtained through a Freedom of Information Act request, detailing the evolution of the Air Force's compliance with the ODMSB, and much progress has been made. Overall, the improvement of military practices in outer space has been driven by an incremental cultural shift within the military. Once more, I will use the example of the US military. In 1964, Maurice Yanovitz published a book titled The Professional Soldier, in which he explained that the military will evolve into what he called at the time a constabulary force through the modification of its skill structure. He forecasted in the 60s that among military officers, the gap would widen between, on the one hand, what he called military managers, generalist military managers, and on the other hand, highly specialized, I quote, military technologists, either trained via a specialized program in military academies or recruited from civilian universities through the Reserves Officer Training Corps program. More than a forecast, this was a prophecy for what concerns American space-related forces. Most of the prominent US space generals were trained or recruited like this. General Shelton, who opened this conference last year, graduated in astronautical engineering at the Air Force Academy. And what we often consider as the embodiment of the space general, General Hyten, was recruited from Harvard through this um, Reserve Officer Training Corps program. In the US Armed Forces, such space military technologists, as Yanovitz would say, are often nicknamed pure space officers because in addition to their initial training, they often have a coherent uh, space carrier path. These officers have a strong, intimate, and passionate knowledge of outer space and are well aware of the importance of the safety, safety and sustainability of the space domain. They go well beyond their natural military reflexes like secrecy and classification to contribute to the development of good and responsible practices. Other countries are consciously or unconsciously following this path. My own country, France, has released a new defense space strategy last year, putting emphasis on the fostering of a new generation of responsible space officers through specialized programs in military academies and related universities as well as through the establishment of a dedicated space academy. This is why I urge my colleagues in academia and government to give these military experts the place they deserve in the definition of international norms of behavior in outer space. Military and national security actors have their own ways at looking at space safety and sustainability and would bring a unique and interesting perspective to the discussions. I will mention three points. The first point concerns operations and semantics at the same time. Talking about managing space traffic is, I believe, inappropriate. When addressing STM policymaking in our discussions, 99% of the time consists in discussing standards for joint operations and communication, data sharing, guidelines for debris mitigation, non-binding rules of the road. As such, STM has little to do with management, but rather with communication, coordination, cooperation, standardization. Semantics is important. The way we address an issue is closely related to our unconscious understanding of the issue, which in turn is heavily dependent on how we name it. We need to identify another term for STM in order to stop believing that management in the sense of control, can be achieved. SPD3 has unfortunately written into stone the term of STM, but I'm confident that we will progressively move forward. In particular, I noticed that in most of the recent public speeches, officials of the Office of Space Commerce have gradually replaced STM by the more neutral expression of space safety and sustainability. This is, I believe, a good step forward. The second point concerns transparency. 
which has significantly improved, even at the DoD. I will not re-explain all that you know, the advances made in terms of declassification, removal of objects from the restricted list of the SATCAP, driven by General Hayton, etc. I want, however, to share two enlightening anecdotes from the maritime and space domain about transparency. The first anecdote was shared by a friend working for AGI, the famous SSA service provider. In 2019, Russian satellite Luch Olymp, the infamous Luch Olymp, was navigating in close proximity to an American geostationary military communication satellite of the WGS constellation. However, after the US TRATCOM released the orbital elements of WGS satellite, including the one supposedly spied on, Luch suddenly changed its course and went far away from the WGS satellite. As my AGI friend said, it was almost like the Russian were going, oh, we didn't know you were right there. We will move away now that we know you're here and we know that it's a military, military satellite. So it shows how transparency on one's own assets can serve to expose a potentially hostile behavior from an adversary. The second anecdote concerns incident having happened to the US Navy in Asia Pacific in 2017. In June and August 2017, two different US Navy destroyers collided with massive civilian vessels, provoking important material damages, but most importantly, the death of 17 US Navy sailors. The reason was that large container ships mostly navigate with instruments and that following um, usual Navy practice, the destroyers were not broadcasting their AIS, which basically gives the name of the ship, the owner, the position, the course of the ship. And so these destroyers were therefore practically invisible to other civilian vessels. During a subsequent Senate hearing, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Richardson, announced that the Navy would adopt a new practice, that in crowded areas, for instance, the Malacca Strait, where the incident happened, US Navy ships would turn on their AIS. He added that in these heavily trafficked areas, using the AIS does not contravene operational security as because it's crowded, Navy ships are anyway directly visible from other ships. And I think that this example can easily find a parallel in our crowded LEO orbits where hiding a satellite is almost impossible. So being transparent would significantly improve safety while not hampering national security utilization. The third point related to the military perspective, and is the most important point in this speech, I believe, concerns norms of behavior. During my interactions with military experts, I identified an underlying debate. What type of behavior are we trying to promote? The answer of most military experts that I met was safe behavior, as opposed to appropriate behavior. While safe behavior embodies the idea of shared values and understanding for the preservation of outer space based on an objective scientific evaluation of risk, appropriate behavior constitutes an acceptable limitation to the freedom of activities in outer space based on subjective consideration, what is appropriate, what is not. To paraphrase James March and Herbert Simon, norms of safe behavior follow a logic of consequence, whereas norms of appropriate behavior follow a logic of appropriateness, literally. I, however, need to point out and regret the confusion that I think was raised by the US Defense Space Strategy of June 2020, which instructed the DOD to, I quote, partner with the Department of State to work closely with allies and partners in order to develop common understanding of appropriate behavior in, say, in space. I was surprised of this phrasing, and I do believe that um, it was a mistake bringing more confusion. Finally, when we talk about norms of behavior, and I'm sure it will be mentioned in the subsequent panel, uh, we are talking about non-binding instruments. So how can they have an impact? Norms of behavior are efficient as long as the largest number of actors believe they are and transcribe them in their national laws and regulation, which are the binding ones. Most of the established 
powers understand the importance of norms of behavior. Of course, also understanding that sometimes, you know, we need exceptional violations for imperious reasons, such as national security. What is more complex is the role, understanding, and support from emerging and non-space actors. Concerns from emerging space nations or even non-space nations about STM regime making are various. These countries are anything but a coherent block. Here are examples of concerns that I could hear uh, from emerging and non-space actors, um, representatives that I met. The first one is very straightforward. Will we be able to use space in the future? In other words, will the space environment be usable? The second concern often heard is that STM rules may limit their ability to develop a space program. This concern is, I would say, the space version of the right to pollute for development type of argument that we usually hear from developing nations in environmental policy discussions on Earth. The third concern relates to inclusion. Will we, as emerging and non-space actors, be part of rulemaking, even if we are currently absent from space? Let us address all these points um, together, starting with the first one. Will space be usable by future space powers? Let us be very clear. Everyone has interest in pursuing space sustainability in the sense that no one has interest in the degradation of the space environment, a fortiori leading powers. So apart from understandable concerns from emerging nations, I do not see any real factual opposition between established and future space power on that point. We all want space to be sustainable. However, it is important to be clear on what we mean by sustainability. Sustainability of the environment for everyone or sustainability of existing activities by a tightening of rules that may hamper the development of newcomers. The second part of this sentence is what drives the main concern of emerging and future space actors. The US, Russia, China, France, the UK, all developed their program through trial and error, which resulted in numerous failed missions and subsequent debris generation. Let us be clear, these countries are at the origin of most of space debris. They are not spontaneous creations of nature. And I concur with Professor Moriba Ja when he pushes for the use of the term of anthropogenic space debris, which makes things really clear. Therefore, seeing this, emerging space nations feel like being cheated, denied the right for error, they feel that STM is a smokescreen for policies aiming at maintaining the status quo of, I would say, primarily American domination in space. So even beyond uh, historical responsibility, which is a fashionable uh, but tricky concept that I personally do not like, in order to secure the adherence of emerging and future space powers to international norms of behavior in space, established power should engage into massive capacity building by showing emerging and future space actors that with support from established powers, they can develop their space program while skipping or at least attenuating the impact of the trial and error phase, we will be able to reach widespread support for norms of behavior, ensuring the safety and sustainability of outer space. In short, in order to ensure worldwide norm diffusion or proliferation. It is key that leading space power include, reassure, and accompany emerging and future space power in their development. Time is running out, and I hope that you end up with remarks with more questions than answer, which was my purpose. Uh, and the panel will be here, I suppose, to answer these questions because they're much wiser than I am. In addition, I want to stress that establishing or even discussing the establishment of an international STM regime without the participation of the most powerful actors in space, the armed forces of world leading power, can only result in either limited or on the contrary, unrealistic proposals. But I know that this is something that my dear friends at the Secure World Foundation understand better than anyone. 
and I cannot wait to see the wonderful panel Victoria has prepared for our delight. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Quentin. That was absolutely fantastic. I really learned a lot. I had no idea STM has been around since the 1910s. Um, I'm curious to know, you raised the idea of a need to bring in the military actors to, in order to get a really thorough and acceptable SDM regime. And I agree. I mean, Secure World has always said they need to include all um, stakeholders to really get a holistic approach to these problems. But, uh, you know, the question I have for you is, do you think that would affect having military actors, would that affect the political ability to come to agreement, especially these international fora that typically have talked about SDM, like the IAA, I mean, they've been largely civil in nature. Does that inherently tweak this approach or how would, how would we get this, um, how would we get this coordinated? So I would say that we should look at it in reverse, which is that without the active participation of military actors and the, um, I would say, uh, actual or even tacit agreement of military actors, most space powers would not adhere to rules that are discussed internationally. And that's, um, that's something that is really important when we think about how to make international regime. So there is this concept of win sets. So there is a win set. Each country at national level defines what is acceptable in international discussions. And then the overlap of all the win sets of all the countries um, is the agreement that will be reached in international um, discussions. And, and what I did for the last three years, uh, so for my PhD, was to look at this national win sets, how the policy is made. I looked at the US, France, and Japan. And in the interagency discussions for STM, SSA, space sustainability, the Department of Defense, Ministry of the Armed Forces in France, or Ministry of Defense in Japan, are key elements. And if a diplomat goes to the COPUS and agree with other country on something that may damage national security actors at home, in the US, the Senate will never ratify that. And, and so that's that's why um, in, in the last paragraph of my remarks, I was saying that not involving them can only result, result in unrealistic proposals because they're the one having the weight at home. And so it's a bit less true for France and Japan that I look, but in the US, the DOD is the actor in space in terms of budget, capabilities. It's, it's a mastodon, it's huge. And, there is no policy related to space that is discussed without someone from the DOD and at least a tacit agreement from the DOD. At least that's what I identified during my research. So, so yes, we absolutely need them. Great, well, thank you, Quentin. Um, I wish we had time to go into some of the, a lot of the questions. Just really quickly, there's one question about how does institutional inertia affect the relative ability of military versus civil actors? to adopt and implement these innovations. Um, if, if you could say that in 30 seconds, I'd really appreciate yeah, that, that, it. That's an excellent point. <laughs> that's an excellent point. And that's true. They, there, there had been some inertia in the military. I think it's changing or it's trying to change. I mentioned this concept of space military technologists that are uh, growing in importance in the DOD. Also through um, a couple, few years ago, the separation between the missile carrier track and the space carrier track. So you have now in the US really specialized and I would say enlightened uh, military officers um, and efforts are to be made in the Space Force. I heard on the, um, so like the purchase, the contact with the industry. And so, so I think this inertia will progressively disappear. Great, thank you. Well, Quentin, this has been really fascinating. I hope your research will be made public. I know there's been a lot of interest. Um, sure. Thank you so much for your insights. Really appreciate it. And um, I thank everyone for tuning in and please stick around for the rest of the policy forum. Thank you very much. Mahalo and a hooey ho. Until we meet again, we thank you for sharing your time with us. We hope to welcome you to Maui for the 22nd Amos Conference, September 14th through the 17th. Aloha.